feel like I'm on like CNN or something. It's like, all right. So welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the wonderful world of pedals. As you see, we have lots of pedals <laughs> in front of us. Um, and like I mentioned before, this will be fairly informal. So uh, if you have questions, absolutely um, ask away. Um, I'll be kind of going through uh, specific um, categories of pedals, and I'll go in depth on some of them. Um, in order for this class not to be like 46 hours long, I won't go <laughs> as in depth as, as I probably could, but um, I'm just going to give a brief overview of of specific types of pedals, how they're used. Kind of, um, I've uh, I'll bring up like a couple songs that have like famous uses of said pedal, um, and just kind of go through. Like, I have my personal board, which is the one down here, and then on the right, uh, some other pedals that, like, I don't personally use, but um, that are really common as well, or different variants of certain pedals. Um, I'm going to go through, um, yeah, different categories, and, and yeah. So, um, how many of you guys actually have pedals, and what do you use? Yes, Luis. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of it is is all about experimentation because you can have a certain pedal do a very specific thing, but you can also, uh, just by tweaking just knobs on it, you can get a totally different sound. And there's all sorts of different categories here. We'll go through a, um, there's a, a bunch of modulation stuff, and like I said, it can get kind of confusing and it can get pretty nerdy in depth, but uh, like I said, I'll try and keep it um as understandable as possible. <laughs> so, um, first off, um, a really, really simple pedal that you will see a lot of people uh, start using uh, is a tuner pedal. So that's, uh, um, if you wanna swap, yeah, cool. That's what, uh, I've personally got a TC Electronic Polytune down there. That's uh, the first pedal, well, I guess the technically the second pedal in my chain here, but uh, um, it, Pretty much, it's a straight-up tuner. So some people like it uh, as as opposed to like the clip-on tuners. Um, clip-on tuners are awesome. Some guitar headstocks don't like <laughs> clip-on tuners. Um, I have a PRS myself, and I find that the clip-on tuner doesn't really fit on a PRS headstock. So uh, just for the widest range of guitars, it's pretty easy to just do a, a tuner pedal. Also, a lot of people like it acting as a mute. So if I do this, and some people, instead of just rolling down the volume or something like that, when they end a song, just click it, it's a mute now. So that's really helpful for a lot of people. You'll see uh, pedals, um, there's specific ones for like bass, acoustic. Most of the time, it's pretty standard for tuner pedals. Um, but uh, some specific ones, like this polytune, I can actually strum, if I have my volume up, I do. It should read, there you go. That little green line there is all the strings at once. So in theory, you can string all your strings. I've had this pedal for probably six or seven years. I rarely use it. <laughs> I don't know why, it's just more convenient for me to just do the single. Um, another one you could find is like the Boss TU3, which is super, super popular. I wanna say they're like about a hundred bucks now. Um, used you can find them for gosh like 40 bucks 50 bucks they're really great little pedals um highly recommend i think the tuner i started out with a tu3 and that was my very first pedal i ever bought which is a little odd for <laughs> most guitar players usually it's like a distortion or some sort of gain um i'm a little weird and i went with a tuner pedal first but um so going into the first category here is uh gain pedals so um, here I actually have a couple uh, gain pedals on my board. Um, I'll start, um, 
if I can do this at the same time. I'll start here. Uh, this EP Boost. This, this guy right there. Uh, that is just a straight up volume boost, like a dB uh, boost. I primarily use that for when I rotate between like a humbucker equipped guitar, like the the Eastman that I have here, and my Strat. Um, what you'll find is humbuckers are quite a lot hotter than most other pickups. So what I do is I set my amp for the humbucker equipped guitar, and then I use the little boost, which is straight volume. It, it colors a little bit. You can find some boosts that don't. Um, it's just straight decibel boost is pretty much what it is to bring it as a level playing field with the other guitars. Um, you might have some pickups that are quite a lot louder, quite a lot hotter than others. Um, for me, I just find that it's helpful to just have that extra volume boost. So when you swap guitars or something, it's not very drastic. And then you have to reset all your levels for stuff. Um, I rotate guitars pretty often, so that's pretty helpful for me. As you can kind of see, the knob's clear, so sometimes it's a little hard to see. I don't have it very high. Um, it's primarily, like I said, just as a volume uh, equalizer on there. So from there, uh, I actually go to this little guy. Uh, that's the Benson preamp. Um, Benson is a really cool company out of Portland. Uh, we are uh, the pedal dealers for them. Um, this one is an exclusive uh, carpet from the Portland airport color. <laughs> I saw it and I had to have it. But uh, so this is a, as a they, it's labeled as a preamp. It pretty much uh, acts as uh, an overdrive with a little bit of EQ controls. So you have the, the treble bass on it and a volume and a drive. So essentially it acts as more of like an overdrive. So overdrive is trying to, um, trying to replicate like a tube amp that's cranked. And back in the 40s and 50s, a lot of guys were using these tiny little, essentially like almost radio style amps, um, like even smaller than the Princeton I've got here is, is our demo amp here. Um, they're like, you know, anywhere between three and five watts. And they would just play them as loud as possible because there really wasn't at that time a way to amplify uh, like having a microphone in front of it wasn't really thought of very easily back then. So um, when they drove those little tube amps really hard, they started to distort, um, started to uh, what you'll um, hear them called as breaking up. So that's what essentially overdrive pedals are s trying to do is emulate that older um, tube amp breaking up, essentially working harder than it needs to, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, and I will uh, play a little bit on that one. Uh, the Benson preamp is specifically based off one of the amplifiers they make uh, called the Chimera, if I'm remembering right. Um, so kind of like a bright uh, Vox-ish kind of sound. Um, I use it here as what's called like edge of breakup or a little saturation, which is where if I hit the guitar hard, it's gonna distort more, and if I back off, it's not gonna be super saturated. So I'll go ahead and play a little bit on that guy. And if you want me to swap to a single coil guitar or something like that to hear the difference, just go ahead and ask, and I can definitely do that. So that's with it, without engaged. Actually, I have that set a little hotter than I would normally run it, but it kind of gives you an idea. Of so I probably run it. That's probably still. Like I was mentioning, they're very configurable, so you can have uh, you can have it be super distorted. I have it f generally. I try and use that as a little bit lower, where it still sounds fairly clean. But if I dig into it, you can hear that break up quite a bit.
can tweak things like like there's the treble and a bass so kind of like a an eq on there to if uh, a certain guitar was a little too bassy and wanted to add a little bit more, it's a little bit more flexible. You might see some drives out there that are just a gain and a volume, which is um, definitely doable. I think we have a couple Earthquaker pedals that's just one knob, <laughs> and it just says more. Um, you can definitely get a good sound out of those ones. I personally like having more flexibility on control because every guitar sounds a little bit different. Every room sounds a little bit different. So um, for me, if I'm playing in a place that has uh it's a really bassy in the room i might turn that bass down a little bit just like the amplifier side of it um, i usually try and set up the amp what i like hearing and then i'll go to the pedals from there um so moving on from like more of the clean boost and the uh overdrive i've got another one which is this called the duelist here and that is a, a dual overdrive so i've got an a and a b which is pretty cool because a lot of pedals are starting to do that more now where they have two channels, so you can operate them independently or in tandem, which is really cool because you can stack them um, or you can use them individually for um, two different levels, which is pretty much what I do. I have pretty saturated on my A and then even more on my B. So um, also there's a bunch of other knobs in there. <laughs> but uh, so uh, with the uh, side A, and I'll go back between here. That's quite a bit brighter. I have the Duelist set a little bit uh, warmer on there. I have the tone straight up, whereas on the Benson, it's brighter naturally, so I have it back down a little bit. to the other side, which should be quite a bit more. And like for me personally, I have them set up a little bit different so if I need a little bit extra push um, like I pretty much use the side B uh, I'll run it a little hotter volume wise and I'll use it pretty much for um, pretty much I run some sort of humbucker style guitar and a single coil guitar when I gig out so uh, I'll use the side B if I'm playing a Strat or something it's got a little extra push to it and then side A for my main guitar or something like that um, and as you can see I can adjust each one individually, which is really cool. I can also stack them. Um, so if I wanted to do both at the same time, totally doable. <laughs> Yeah, and that's pretty much, uh, it might seem like it's really saturated, but it's still trying to emulate that that uh, really push tube amp. Um, we'll get into the kind of like distortion pedals in a little bit, which are um, more, the way that they operate is a little bit differently. Um, actually, I'll show you a demo of it a little bit later, but I will talk about the distortion then. Um, so I've got a MXR super badass distortion and a full bore metal. Uh, and essentially on the distortion, I kind of think of it as like more man-made uh, overdrive essentially. So what they do, instead of emulating a push tube amp, um, they push that frequency that your guitar is and they clip the very top of it. So instead of having a peak like you normally would have, um, if you think about it like a, like a frequency spectrum, like if you recorded a guitar and you see the lines like this, uh, a, 
a distortion pedal will will squish that and make it a flat line at the very top and that's where you get that clipping on there um so on there yeah so distortion is essentially your your next step from overdrive a more saturated a more um not necessarily vibrant but it's definitely it's a lot stronger and when i swap over to the second board um we'll kind of show you what that what that sounds like on there um what you'll find is the distortion pedals like uh, a, a boss ds1 a heavy metal and excuse me uh, a rat uh, pedal they're um they wanted to peek through a mix a little bit more. That's why a lot of them can be a little bit brighter, a little bit pushier, is because stuff in the 80s and 90s, they wanted a lot more overdrive, or they wanted more distortion to, to poke through some of these mixes where you have uh, a really fat uh, EQ spectrum, um, like drums and bass and, and stuff like that's taking up a lot of spectrum. Your guitar, we want to squash that, make it a little bit brighter and, and poke through that mix a little bit easier. Um, and on pretty much so many songs have overdrive and distortion it's 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 hard to pick one that's that's like an epitome of the the sound and they're all a little bit different if you get into the nitty gritty of of a lot of uh pedals like overdrive pedals and stuff like that there's different variants you'll have like tube screamers that have a different eq setup than you might have on um like a rat or something like that it's going to be a, a very different animal so uh, there's tons and just experiment and find what sounds good to you um, for me i kind of like tube screamer-esque pedals that's kind of what the duelist and not necessarily the benson but the duelist is more of like a tube screamer pedal just minus the the as harsh uh middle that some tube screamers have so if you think of like uh stevie ray vaughn was a tube screamer user Lots of people are tube screaming users, but that's always my good good example is like anything Stevie Ray Vaughan um, had some of the old school tube screamers and yeah. Um, so the next step from there is a uh, fuzz. So I've got this uh, red pedal here called the Spanish Castle, which it takes like the duelist. It's a dual channel fuzz, um, and on there, fuzz is a cousin to distortion. It's quite a bit heavier um, it's more saturated uh, essentially how fuzz kind of came about was there was a marty robbins song from i think it was like 1961 um, called don't worry and uh, what happened is the guitar solo came around and the guitar session guitar player um, plugged in his six string bass um, probably a dan electro or a fender six of some sort um, into a preamp channel and the preamp tube died in the process of recording and it was just such a bizarre sound to hear because it sounded like his amp was dying essentially and a lot of people really liked it and uh there was actually a couple of ventures tunes around that same time where they said we want this sound and so they had a guy design a pedal around it and a uh, really great example is of really early fuzz is rolling stones satisfaction that's like one of the quintessential really early fuzz tunes um then you get into uh stuff like the later 60s Jimi hendrix with like a dunlop fuzz face that is another quintessential like foxy lady or um uh what's the other one purple haze duh um that's another really great um fuzz track and essentially what you're doing is is so when you have the clipping there's the thing called bias on there. I've got, uh, this is kind of like a, a fuzz face kind of thing. Um, you're letting more frequency on the bias um, the more you turn it. So when you have it less, it's letting, um, it's kind of squishing your signal. And then when you turn that bias up, it's letting more of that signal out. Um, and I will, they play, they can play well with wah, which we'll get into in a little bit. And that's, a lot of like Jimi Hendrix stuff is a fuzz into a wah, um, especially in like the uh, the Woodstock stuff. But this is uh, my side A of the fuzz. <laughs> And for me, I kind of like my fuzzes a little bit with m a little bit more clarity. You can absolutely uh, turn the tone super low, and that's actually where you get some stuff like uh, 
Let's see if I can get it. Like the solo to Sunshine of Your Love is another really great example of a fuzz. The and that's just like a Marshall and a Les Paul kind of thing into a fuzz. And that's pretty much all that that song really is. And there's even fuzz on the bass. It's not as drastic as uh, Clapton's guitar in that moment. But it's kind of cool. It, it's... Pedals are not necessarily just for guitars. Uh, we'll get in, when we get into modulation and stuff like that, guitars steal a lot from keyboard players. <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll touch on a little later, acoustic players also have pedals as well. So it's not just an electric specific thing. If you're a bass player, you can absolutely use pedals. Um, but uh, for as far as the fuzz stuff go, um, I keep the bias kind of a little lighter. Um, so it's not as chaotic <laughs> on there um, stuff like uh, was it muse uses a lot of fuzz for a more modern um, band um, they use it on bass too I think their bass player and probably every guitar player <laughs> in that band has a fuzz of some sort um, but yeah like the the purple haze kind of thing the <laughs> Blaze, but and you'll often find uh, players describe fuzz as being a little splatty, and that's when that's where that biasing thing comes in, because you might, uh, if you let certain frequencies in, um, it's the tonal characteristic is not as defined on there. So that's when you hear a guitar player mention like, oh, that's kind of a splatty sound. That's usually from it. You'll hear that stuff on like a big muff, um, where they're a little bit harsher. Well, uh, when we swap over to the second board, I've got an Earthquake or Hazumi Toss, which is a much more aggressive fuzz. I usually keep mine fairly low, so it's not super duper crazy on there. But uh, yeah, and then um, another one is time-based effects. So when we're talking about time-based, it's manipulating um, your guitar signal uh, post. So uh, when we think of time-based effects, there's uh, reverb and then there's delay. So on like my board, I almost always play with an amp with reverb, so I don't usually have a reverb pedal on my uh, on my board. Um, I let the amp take care of it. I usually keep it fairly light. Um, but when we swap over to the second board, I've got two different um, uh, pedals on there that we'll go to and and kind of go um, kind of see what they can do. But uh, as far as reverb goes. It's probably one of the most used effects next to overdrive. Um, so many amps have them. So many tracks from the 50s, 60s have reverb. If it's not on the guitar, it's on the whole track itself. And some of it was done really old school where it's just a really empty metallic room or a drum <laughs> where they placed the guitar amp and they did it that way. Um, a lot of amp companies like Fender kind of found a way to do it um, where it's actually using springs in the inside of the amplifier um, down below. So if you've ever picked up a Fender uh, tube amp and accidentally set it down a little too hard, you will definitely hear those springs move. <laughs> um, but um, a lot of, like if I played just clean and I didn't put any reverb, uh, I'll do that here in a second, sometimes it sounds a little off guitar players were so used to having a little bit of reverb on everything that when it plays clean, it almost feels like something's missing. And I didn't have, uh, turn that off. I didn't have uh, a lot of reverb on the amp. I probably had it set to like two, but. Uh, <laughs> Like I'm so, we're so used to guitar players hearing something trailing off. Like if I was playing like a funk tune, that probably would be exactly what I want, as I don't want a lot of stuff happening after I stop playing. When I introduce the reverb, you can kind of hear that trail where it's um, it's leaving off, and and you get a little bit extra. So if you're playing 
um, kind of sparsely, that actually kind of fattens up your sound a little bit. Um, what you'll find a lot of people, uh, especially in like surf rock and stuff like that, their amps are like maxed on the reverb. Like that's almost <laughs> exclusively just wet. But if you're hearing stuff like like old school venture stuff. We're so used to hearing that from from just like surf music in general. It's not necessarily a surf thing uh, from the get go, but a lot of that's when it really became super popular on amplifiers. And you'll you'll see a lot of guys, not to necessarily throw them under the bus, but you'll hear um, a lot of like uh, worship musicians use a lot of reverb and delays and stuff like that, and they'll do like volume swells. Let's see if I can get. they let the the trail do most of the heavy lifting and not necessarily the pick. It's a little hard to do on a Les Paul. Probably should have swapped over to him, but um, uh, you'll see them do a lot of these tricks, which are really cool. Um, they'll have volume pedals, which are just a volume control that looks like a wah, um, and it'll just control the volume of your guitar. So you can do these volume swells with your foot, which is really cool. Um, I personally use my reverb at like between two and three, just just enough that there's a little bit of trail on the back end. Um, like I said, it, it feels a little weird to not have reverb. I think I've every amp I've ever owned had some sort of reverb on it, and I always had it on because you have it, so might as well use it. So next one is delay. So up here I've got a Strymon Timeline. Um, that uh, is fairly new to me. Uh, I had always used a uh, MXR carbon copy, which is one of my all-time favorite delay pedals. Um, it is a uh, analog delay pedal. So that w when you see delay, you'll see one of two things. You'll see analog and digital. And the difference between them is essentially on an analog delay, uh, your signal goes into it and it uses certain capacitors, and there's actually a couple chips in there, that will uh, change your signal, um, it'll repeat, well, delay is pretty much something that repeats after you play a, a, a note or a, a thing. Um, and so the analog delay, signal goes in, the pedal will, will repeat what you played, and then um, convert it back to an analog signal on the back end. So on a digital pedal, uses a different kind of chipset, and uh, due to the way that the chips are designed, they're infinitely configurable, essentially. They're so, uh, they're much more uh, variable. You, you have so many more parameters to change on them. Because the chipset's different, um, your signal goes in as analog, will stay digital, um, and then most of the time it converts it. Sometimes it doesn't and it stays digital. You can do it that way through MIDI or stuff like that. Um, but it will tweak your sound, make it digital, uh, and then pass it on to the next uh, pedal. So it being digital, you can have memory banks. You can have all sorts of stuff because the chipset is more advanced than an analog delay. Um, for the longest time, I'd used my carbon copy as an analog delay. Uh, no tap tempo on it. It just was an arbitrary like rate and subdivision. That was it. I pretty much... You just had to guess <laughs> if you had a specific tone you wanted. The nice thing with digital delays like this timeline, I have a tap tempo button. So if I have a song in a specific tempo, I can now tap it on there and it's going to match that song. Um, so on here I have one of the uh, presets. So this is more like a slapback delay. Uh, slapback was like old school rockabilly and stuff like that, where it's a really short delay. It's almost close to like, kind of like a reverb. So 
So it's kind of a little hard to hear on there. But it's it's stu essentially kind of like a stutter where you'll hear one repeat of the note and then it pretty much dies. So if I did that a little slower. So then you can hear the delay a little bit better. So like what I just played, uh, Mr. Sandman, uh, it's a fast song, so the slap bag needs to be pretty tight on the on the tempo. But if I it still only has about a repeat or two on the back end. Um, also, uh, sometimes not all. Uh, I don't hit my notes all the time, so if you have a delay. Other people will know that you didn't hit your note. <laughs> uh, definitely been in a position where... There we go. That's what I want. Uh, that does happen. So so this one has kind of like a funky uh, dotted rhythm. And you hear it repeat a couple times, and then it stops. <laughs> So stuff like on an analog delay, that wouldn't be possible. You wouldn't have the tap tempo. You wouldn't be able to do, like this one has a dotted rhythm. You wouldn't be able to get that intricate with them. It's it's more, uh, I almost think of it, it's more of a feeling. It's kind of a guess on some analog delays. It's roughly here uh, for your tempo and stuff like that for repeat. So um, really common, what you'll find is one of the most popular uh, delay pedals is the like the DD3, DD7 from Boss. They have an analog style um, pedal or, or uh, option on there. Um, they are fairly inexpensive nowadays. Um, there's a lot of delay pedals that do all sorts of stuff. So um, it's kind of cool to mess around with delay. Delay is super configurable, especially like I mentioned the digital stuff. So you can have memory banks and stuff like that. Uh, I've had this Strymon for maybe three or four months, and I still haven't even explored half the settings on there. <laughs> it's it's a lot. Uh, it's kind of intimidating at first, um, but uh, stuff like the DD7s are much easier. They're in your typical boss housing. Makes a lot of sense on those ones. Um, and uh, um, some songs you might recognize that have a lot of delay. Um, See if I can do this one, like a Pink Floyd. Where it's got a couple of repeats in the back of it. Uh, you'll find a lot of U2. The Edge is really known for using a ton of delays on his stuff, like the Where the Streets Have No Name. Um, the intro to Guns N' Roses, uh, Welcome to the Jungle, that's a delay pedal in the very beginning. That or whatever the intro lick to that song is. That intro is, is a straight up delay pedal. Um, or the police walking on the moon, that's a great example of like a dotted delay. Um, yeah, a uh, uh, carbon copy, like I mentioned. The uh, Earthquaker Dispatch Master is a reverb and delay combo, which is really cool. Um, the Line 6 DL4 is a, is a uh, multi-processor delay, kind of like the Strymon timeline here. Um, and those are uh, a couple uh, timing-based ones. You'll also find a looper. Um, I don't have a looper on any of these boards right here, but since I'm here, I'll show it to you here. Uh, this is my little acoustic board when I play solo shows. Uh, as Camden can see that. <laughs> so on here, um, I have a tuner pedal. This is my old TU3 that I've had forever. This was my first pedal ever. Um, on here, I've got a Digitech Jam Man, uh, which is kind of similar to your old school Boss RC20. Uh, two pedal uh, looper. And essentially a looper, all it is is you can play something, 
tap a button and it will play it back for you. So it's pretty simple. Um, they do take a little bit uh, getting used to. Um, Boss and stuff like that have come out with a lot of great looper pedals, RC1s, RC5s. Um, you can get them small in like a single pedal unit where it's essentially, if you take it, and just, just this side. Uh, and some you can store. I have a couple. This one had takes like an old SD card because it's kind of ancient. But uh, I have uh, passes built in where I've f uh, made it like a full song. And I'll play along with that when I do solo shows. Um, uh, take a little bit of, of time. They can be intimidating as well. Sometimes it's hard getting the timing right on a lot of loop, loop uh, pedals. Um, they can come as small or big as you want. Uh, I also have a RC300, which is, you know, a big pedal. It's like this big. And I've been too intimidated to <laughs> go and learn how to use it because I'm so used to this two-pedal unit. And then while we're here, this uh, LR Bags unit, excuse me, is just a, uh, it's a DI box, essentially. So uh, on acoustic boards, usually a DI will convert it to like an XLR out. So a lot of uh, PA systems can easily take your acoustic guitar uh, a lot of pickups I use are the K&K &K, uh, Pure Minis, so they don't have controls on board the acoustic. So I use this guy. So there's volume and EQ controls here, uh, so I can set my level depending on where I am, and then it uh, goes XLR out from there. So I keep it pretty simple. Uh, I have seen acoustic players use like a delay, a reverb, and a chorus. Really easy acoustic setup on there. Um, I just keep mine fairly easy because I don't you really use a lot of effects on acoustic stuff, but you can totally do it. It, it exists. But uh, as far as loopers go, like I mentioned, RC1, 5, RC30, um, usually they're like about 110 bucks, I think, for the RCs nowadays. Really easy to get into them. Um, they're nice and bright displays, so you can kind of see where you're going. Um, really helpful, um, pro especially for practicing at home learn your scales and stuff like that just by playing a chord and then looping or looping that chord and then playing over the top of it. Um, and then, so as far as pitch bass stuff goes, uh, I've got a few. So uh, this pink pedal here with the wolf on it, that is a Walrus Audio Monument. And that is a uh, vibrato and harmonic, well, I should back up. It is a tremolo unit. Uh, but it's got some other stuff going on. So uh, tremolo, which is often called vibrato. Thank you, Leo Fender, for that confusing everyone on earth. Uh, this Princeton Reverb has a vibrato unit. It's not really vibrato. Uh, vibrato implies that there's a pitch changing um, waver, where tremolo is straight volume. And that's pretty much all um, vibrato is, is just your volume swelling up and down depending on your rate. Uh, when you get into vibrato, it's your pitch is going up and down at a specific rate. Uh, this monument that I have is both uh, vibrato and tremolo, and I can actually combine both of them, which is a thing that Fender came up with in the 60s with like the showmans, I think. They did a thing called harmonic tremolo. So harmonic tremolo is essentially vibrato and volume uh, with the tremolo combined into one effect. So I'll show you what that kind of sounds like. It's more of like, kind of like an organ kind of effect, which is prim primarily how I use it. I'll go down to the standard tremolo. And like I said, it's just straight volume. So um, I've got a tap tempo here. I was like using like a kind of a faster rate. <laughs> Used to that for like uh, old spaghetti westerns and, and stuff like that. And I could make it slower. Uh, Vermato is kind of a cool um, effect where you can, if you play it just right with a tempo, you can actually get it to fatten up your sound a little bit so it sounds like there's something else behind you. So it just kind of fills out your sound just a little bit. Even though your volume is dropping, it's not completely shutting off. You can definitely set some vibratos to that. 
or excuse me, some tremolos. Thanks, Fender. Uh, you can set some tremolos to do that. It can, depending on your wavelength. Um, or this one's pretty fancy. It's got, like, I can do dotted uh, 16ths and all sorts of crazy um, music notation kind of things to it. Um, but I usually keep mine fairly flat. Uh, there's some songs I do in a couple bands I play where uh, I do a lot of, like, James Bondy. <laughs> Which is great. I, that's one of my favorite sounds of all time, is just a tremolo unit and playing some sparse chords. Uh, always sounds great to me. But uh, I'm going to flip it to harmonic tremolo so you can hear what kind of like vibrato and tremolo sounds like. So that's got a bit more pitch warble on it. So that was something that Fender did with the, uh, the I think it was Showman's, um, as kind of like an appeal. Um, in the 60s, you started getting Leslie cabinets. Uh, guitar players were stealing them from keyboard players, where a Leslie cabinet has two horns that are spinning at different speeds. And the pedal to my left here is a Leslie simulator. And so in the band that I play with, we do a lot of blues and rock. Um, and sometimes when uh, one of the other players is soloing, I will kick on either the uh, tremolo here or um, the Leslie simulator uh, to kind of get a different sound. Um, essentially, I, I turn into a rhythm player at that point, and I just kind of pick something a little different. So um, this kind of also replaced, I used to have a chorus on my board for a long time, and I kind of use the slow speed as kind of like a fake chorus. So on there, if you can see the two lights that are alternating, that's essentially your bass horn and your treble horn spinning on a, on a Leslie uh, cabinet. So that's what's getting us that uh, chorusy sound is they're two, they're spinning at different speeds. Uh, if you hear enough like uh, Beatles stuff, they use this around like the Abbey Road era. Uh, Let It Be has a Leslie guitar, an actual cabinet um, George Harrison's playing through. Um, and if I click this button, and primarily why I like the Neo Ventilator, uh, that was like probably the fourth pedal I ever bought. And it, it was something I didn't expect, but I heard it and I was like, I don't know what this is, but I need it. Um, I love how... Uh, just natural it sounds when you click the speed up button. A lot of um, Leslie simulators don't sound natural when they speed up. It just sounds like someone hit fast forward. Um, the Fender Pinwheel is also one that does this really well, um, which we also have. Um, but you can kind of see the lights, how they slow down, which is really cool. So I'll, I'll demonstrate how that speeds up. <laughs> It's really cool. It's an effect uh, like uh, uh, Cream's Badge. Just a really cool, different effect. And how I normally use it in our in the band that I'm in is I will essentially try and copy as best I can, like an organ. <laughs> and stuff like that it's really cool texture thing um I have done a few sessions for people in the past where I always bring that one with me because it's always one that's like, that's something I didn't think I needed. Um, and just gives a really cool texture to, to like if you're recording stuff on your own or anything like that. It's a pretty cool effect. They can be kind of spendy. Um, and for me, I've 
probably paid for it by now. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, you can control all sorts of stuff on here. You can control drive. Uh, back in the day, um, a lot of like Hammond players and stuff like that, they were overdriving their amplifiers and stuff like that with the hot at signal. So that's why you have drive, distance, essentially microphone um, placement from the, the cabinet that you're using. Um, and balance is just uh, left is low, right is high. Um, pretty simple. Um, I've always liked this one. Um, they make newer ones that are a lot smaller, but this one's old. I like it. It sounds the best to me, but, um, as I actually click it, it's got old clunky buttons. Um, let's see. So the other thing is, um, I don't have one here, but, uh, a pitch shift or a pitch, uh, manipulator. So you'll find stuff like, uh, um, uh, electro harmonics pog, the electro harmonics pitch fork, the OC five from boss, um, the PS5 Harmonist, the Digitech Whammy, which is like uh, Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine, is almost synonymous with that pedal. Um, essentially, all you're doing is uh, it will influence the pitch that you play. So PS5 from Boss is a Harmonist, so you can choose, do you want it to harmonize an octave or a fifth or a third? Uh, and when, when you play, it'll have multiple instruments or multiple you uh, playing along with you um, is different notes. So uh, you can do a lot of people use the harmonist for an octave down, uh, which is what the uh, pog uh, from electro harmonics is. Uh, I think we have a couple pitchforks, which you can do um, different scale degrees. Um, like you can have an octave and st stuff like that. So um, they are pretty common. Um, is kind of a, a, like I said, a different texture. A lot of pedals are just texture stuff. Um, technically, you don't need any pedals, uh, but I always like having stuff that, that serves, um, serves the song, uh, whatever I'm playing. Um, like I have a tendency to do more 60s stuff in one band, and so I like having the tremolo and the Leslie thing. Um, like I said, just serving the song as best I can. Um, and that's pretty much my board, with the exception of uh, I can get into filter stuff since I have two of them here. So I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. So uh, I have a wah, which is this copper uh, crybaby here. Um, a wah is just a frequency sweep. So uh, what you're doing is like uh, your guitar's tone might be like a uh, like a bell curve or something like that. You're essentially manipulating that that bell curve. Um, and, you know, lots of uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix SRV is like a drive and a wah is really uh, what you find a lot. So uh, on here I have two filter devices, which uh, the wah is here. It's a manual sweep with your foot. Helps if I turn them off. So really, um, really expressive, uh, which is why I chose this one specifically, but uh, <laughs> And I'm just manipulating the frequency spectrum. So when I go back to the rear, it's pretty, uh, pretty muddy. But as I sweep forward, it gets a little bit brighter than actually your standard tone will be. Um... Yeah, you'll hear a lot of Hendrix, a lot of SRV, a lot of Metallica, too. Kirk Hammett is a really big proponent of the Wah. I think he has, like, two or three or has had signature models. Uh, you will find the Crybaby is one of the, if not the most popular Wah pedal out there. Uh, Vox also makes Wah pedals. They're a bit brighter. Um, 
in my experience, I found that the Crybaby works really well with soloing, and the Voxwa is really great for rhythm stuff. If you're doing like funky uh, leads, I find the Crybaby to be a little dark. <laughs> I lose a little bit of that definition on there. Um, and I primarily use mine for more lead stuff, but that's that one. I also have this Electroharmonics Qtron, which between that and the Timeline are my two newest ones on here. This is essentially an envelope filter, very similar to a wah, but I'm actually controlling it automatically. It's got a sensitivity thing on there. So the harder I play, the more that filter opens up there. <laughs> So it's a little like more squishy, I guess, uh, as compared to the um, the wah there. It's kind of a little odd pedal, but I like using it as, like I said, texture stuff. Uh, also, if you're familiar with um, uh, a John Mayer tune called uh, "I Don't Trust Myself," he uses essentially a bigger version of a Qtron to get the. So he uses um, uh, a little setup a little differently. I have quite a bit of that quack coming back at me, um, which is how I have this one set up. But So if I play light, it doesn't open up the filter as wide. But when I play harder, it, it like essentially quacks back at me. It opens up that filter more for the frequency. <laughs> So that's that one. I use that one kind of sparingly. It's kind of a newer pedal I just wanted to try. I was listening to a lot of um, a funk player named Corey Wong, um, and he uses a lot of Ottawa on his stuff. So um, I just kind of wanted to try it out and see if I liked it. So um, I'm going to swap over to the second board now and then um, kind of show you what I've got on there. I've got some other uh, kind of different pedals on there. But before I do, um, any questions so far? Or anything you want me to try again or play a little bit more on? No? Yeah. Two questions. All right. Kathy first. <laughs> I will say a mixture of both. Because <laughs> inevitably, I will find a setting I really, really like. I will leave it there, and then inevitably it will get bumped or something in transit, and I'll lose that that sound I really liked. So I have a tendency to take pictures of my board a lot. <laughs> so I remember, especially if I play a gig and I've adjusted something on the fly and it sounds really good to me, I will make sure I take a picture of it for the end of the night so I can go back to that setting if I can. Um, I think... A lot of it comes down to just where I am and what um, I play with a lot of different people. So I'm often adjusting a lot of stuff on the fly. If I probably played with just one band, I probably would have stuff set the exact same every time. Um, because I float around with different guitars um, and different people, I have a tendency to f swap a lot of stuff on the fly. Um, for most people, they're usually set it and forget it. But like I said, it's all about experimentation. So find what sounds good to you and then and roll with that. And Luis. Mm -hmm. It definitely can. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have a tendency to mainly run as clean as I can and start there. Some guys like running amplifiers a bit hotter. Um, I can't always do that depending on where I'm playing. So sometimes I like just having a set, uh, clean sound, and starting from there. That being said, 
uh, I do use drive fairly often. So if I don't have a drive, that kind of throws me off a little bit. Um, I've had, before I swapped to this board, I have a, I had a different board and different cable setup, and I would frequently have cables go out on me. Uh, so I've definitely played a handful of gigs where like half of my board will go out. And it's like, well, there goes, there goes my delay. There goes my Leslie simulator. There goes this pedal. And so I have to, um, not necessarily make it up on the spot, but I definitely have to roll with the punches on that. Um, since kind of go upgrading my setup, which Andrew will teach next week, um, since upgrading that, I have very little issues um, running like isolated power supplies, nice cables and stuff like that. Um, I don't have as many. <laughs> I don't have as many. The gymnastics. If there ever was a, a uh, an advertisement for getting a wireless setup, it would be this. I have so many cables. Um, don't recommend using two pedal boards, though, so that's fair. Um, yeah, it, it you just kind of have to roll with it sometimes. So I primarily use a, a head and cab that's um, quite a bit hotter than this Princeton is. I do have a Princeton for smaller gigs. I think Princeton's are the one of the most underrated little amps you can absolutely get. Um, and I have a pretty clean. It's only at about a three. Um, so there have been a lot of small gigs where I've just run a Princeton at like three or four. And that's usually plenty loud for a lot of occasions. I'm just a guitar player. I like big loud amps uh, as much as my ears sometimes don't appreciate that. Or the singer <laughs> doesn't appreciate that sometimes. Um, but yeah, it just primarily comes down to once I get there, I'll set up stuff. And oftentimes I will definitely tweak uh, levels and stuff like that. A lot of the drives have their own individual volume controls, so I'll have to reset stuff. Um, when I came in this morning, I had all my levels were a lot louder because the last time I played out was a, a bigger venue, so and we weren't mic'd, so I had I had to reset a lot of the levels, which um, it kind of depends. It sounds really good when it's really loud, but also not everyone appreciates being blasted in the front row with a <laughs> with a forty watt amplifier. Um, so yeah, we'll move over to the other side. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I would say almost, um, every pedal should be able to, to go back and forth between both. Um, one thing I was going to talk about at the end, which kind of leads me into talking about it now is I think that the easiest and best way if you've never owned pedals or a pedal board or anything like that it's to go get a uh boss makes some great ones so does line six like a multi-fx unit i think there are it's financially probably the easiest <laughs> to do because a lot of pedals out there you know nice ones go for like 100 150 and if you're building a multi-pedal pedal board that gets really spendy really fast um so what I usually recommend is getting like a uh, like a GT100 or something like that from Boss. That's like two pedals, and you have Boss's library or Line Six's um, effects library on there. And I always usually try and recommend those first because you can figure out the effects that you want. Not everyone wants an envelope filter because it's kind of weird. Not everyone needs three drives. Not everyone needs certain pedals so you can use those find what pedals you like if you want to keep the multi effects for later awesome if not you can sell that and put that towards getting some some more specific pedals um i for some reason skipped that stage i went straight to pedals which um is more uncommon i don't see a lot of people go straight into physical pedals um i had a lot of teachers that i liked the pedal setups they had so i just started doing it that way with um, getting like a tube screamer for, uh, and a wah. And I had those, uh, the tuner, a tube screamer and a wah. That was my first little pedal board. And I slowly started upgrading what I knew I liked, upgrading from a tube screamer to like an OCD pedal, went from an OCD um, actually to the duelist here. And I just started upgrading stuff along the way, which is totally doable. You can absolutely do that. And I think a lot of people have a preconceived notion for like stuff like the Helix and stuff like that. Uh, when you show up with one, they're like, oh, cool, it's going to be this guy. It, It's actually, it makes sense on paper. I can totally see why people do it because, you know, if you calculated how much money you spend on a, on a pedal board and stuff like that, getting it wired with a power supply and everything, 
that can get really spendy. You can spend, you know, thousands of dollars getting a perfect pedal board set up, but, you know, most multi-FX units are like 300 bucks somewhere around there. I know uh, Line 6 makes the Stomp, uh, which we do have a few on order. They're a little bit more. They're like five or 600 bucks, 650 Price check, yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a few of those coming, and those are just the uh, pedals on board um, of the Helix, essentially. So they uh, Line 6 has a really cool trickle down from the Helix. If you like the Helix, but the $1,600, $1,500 price tag is pretty hefty, um, they trickle down all the way to the Pod Go with the same effects built in. You just lose some of the cabinet sim and amp sim stuff. So if you already have an amp, that's usually a pretty good way to go. Um, a lot of amps like the Mustangs and the Boss Katana also have built-in effects, which is really cool. Um, that's another really good way of trying out some effects, especially if you don't have an amplifier. That's a really good way of trying out some effects to see if you like them. Um, you might find that's like, I like this setting on a Mustang. Um, usually they're clever and they do legally differentiating names <laughs> for their settings. Um, Sultans of Swang, or tw Sultans of Twang, I think, is one of them. It's stuff like that. And you can figure out, like, ooh, that's a delay, and it's a little bit of drive, and I really like that. So you can go from there, excuse me, and uh, find the pedals that sound good to you and, and uh, kind of experiment a little bit more. So uh, does that kind of answer your question? Okay. <laughs> it's like going off on a different tangent altogether. Uh, but, yeah, it is, is coming back to your question, though, um, they should work just fine on, on any. You don't have to have a tube amp. You don't have to have a um, a, a digital amp or anything like that. Um, I've done a couple jams before where it's like the amplifier they have for, for the jam is like a Champion 50 or something like that. It's like not my, not my go-to amp, but I can definitely make that work. Um, especially stuff like... Um, Hank, Lu Luis, and I have tried it. Doing the Benson, um, there's a preamp out on the uh, Boss Katana. And just running that preamp out into that sounds great. Uh, like, surprisingly great. I would, didn't expect that to, to sound as good as it did. But um, stuff like that can just kind of lift uh, an amplifier up um, that gives it a little bit more life, uh, I guess, in that way of um, if you're not... 100% sold on your amplifier sound, get a pedal, that might change it. Um, or uh, you could look for a different amp, but pedals are generally a little bit cheaper than most amps, so. <laughs> um, so going over, uh, I'm gonna see how this is gonna work, but um, let's try this. Hey, it worked, kind of. All right, so on here, I have a handful of different other pedals. So uh, like we were talking about on the drives before, um, I've got two different distortion pedals, um, the Super Badass from MXR as well as the Full Bore Metal. Um, the Full Bore Metal is going to be EQ'd for what a lot of like hard rock and metal guys do like because, like I mentioned earlier, they're trying to get a bit more brightness, a bit more push uh, to separate themselves in a mix. So uh, I'm going to try the... Uh, super badass distortion here first and then we'll uh, see how that goes ah. <laughs> And stuff like the distortion and stuff like that, specifically this one, uh, sometimes you can hear a little bit different things. Like when I was playing through my Duelist, it didn't quite have, you hear a lot of this, which actually can definitely be a different, um, I hate using the word vibe, but it, it totally is because you hear a lot more of the harmonic string. Uh, noise from it, which some guys like doing that. 
they like doing that stuff, the pick rakes, when you rake your pick down the side of the string, um, stuff like that, like the, you know, that they were doing in the 80s and 90s and, you know, hard rock guys were really liking that. They like that harmonic string noise, I guess, if you call it. Um, and, then, and then the metal, the full bore metal, kind of takes it to an entirely different um, level. So it's going to be quite a bit brighter. I'm going to see if I can attempt something metal E. played along with that pedal <laughs> so uh on that one it definitely has its own eq style it definitely sounds like its own thing um and you have tons of controls on there um from all sorts of stuff like uh, uh okay cool i couldn't tell if you could see everything um there's frequencies you can change um mid boosts and all sorts of stuff like that so they are super configurable um I'd probably, it, it's not really my, uh, metal's not my cup of tea, so I can't explicitly talk about a lot of, like, the specifically heavy distortions and stuff, because I don't have a ton of experience on them, um, but I do know, like, for someone looking for that kind of, like, uh, a nicer DS1 sound, like the boss, uh, they nickname them Angry Bees, because that's pretty much what they sound like. Uh, which is a lot of guitar players' first pedals because they were really inexpensive back then. Um, you know, you could get one for like 50, 60 bucks back then. Um, but kind of like a, a, a more boutique take on that, I guess. Uh, next one I have is the Hizumitas, which is another fuzz. So, like, mine are more um, uh, fuzz face, like Dunlop style. Uh, this one is definitely its own thing from Earthquaker. Um, if you are interested in fuzz, uh, we always recommend this pedal. It's not crazy expensive. It's, I think it's one forty nine ninety nine. Just a great sounding fuzz. Uh, Earthquaker has been doing a lot of really cool um, pedals that obviously they have pedals that are pretty expensive, but they've been putting out a lot of like lesser expensive but really nice pedals. Uh, the Plumes is a Tube Screamer style pedal, which we have a bunch of, and they're under a hundred bucks. And they sound incredible for 100 bucks. You get a bunch of controls on them. You can use them like a clean boost, like I originally opened with my little pedal for the uh, that I used when I swip, swapped to a Stratocaster or something with single coils. There's a mode for that. You can go into a tube screamer mode. They sound incredible for 100 bucks. Uh, but this one's a Hizumitas, which is a fuzz. It's actually a signature um, pedal uh, that came out. Oh, what about six? not even six months ago yeah um and it's already one of the best selling pedals of 2022 um the plumes held on for i think one or two years for the best selling pedal um so they've been putting out some really crazy good stuff but anyway here's the hizumi toss <laughs>
the Dunlop style fuzz. It's got some, um, it's got a sustain button and a tone uh, knob on it. Uh, the sustain on these are incredible. Like if you just want to hold out a note, it will hold on to it for as long as possible. <laughs> like uh, we did time it once with a, with a Les Paul style guitar and it was like almost a minute long. It just held on to a note. It was pretty, pretty crazy. Um, so that's the Huzumi toss and going over um, back to uh, some filter uh, or not filter. So um, I haven't talked about chorus and uh, flanger and phaser. So chorusing is essentially just your guitar signal ever so slightly delayed and then a little bit um, of pitch uh, modulation on it. So um, that was really common in the 80s that's pretty much when chorus like really hit its peak um you will find stuff like um uh, i think actually let me i know there's an eddie van halen tune that uses i think it's a eruption no that's the flanger so um so on here uh, really common uh, modulation tune. So you'll have the Boss CE series, CE1, CE3, CE5, and then the Waza chorus are incredible uh, um, chorus pedals. Right here I have a used uh, Maxon uh, super chorus or stereo chorus, which um, I'm only running mono, so one amp, but if you ran a stereo rig, some of these things like reverbs, delays, and chorus, sound just insane when you do a stereo rig because they're bouncing back and forth like you're on uh, specifically for this chorus your your dry signal will come out of one amp and your wet your delayed signal will come out the second which is really really cool um it's kind of a pain to set up a stereo rig and not everyone does it anymore because no one really wants to haul two amps to a gig <laughs> but they sound really awesome if you ever get a chance to do it um I will go ahead and play a little bit on this stereo chorus here. songs that use a chorus effect. So Message in a Bottle by The Police and then Come As You Are by Nirvana. Um, just sounds really cool and it does a lot with the, the pitch stuff. So um, what I see sometimes even is acoustic players will use a chorus. Uh, they'll keep the mix fairly low but it's just enough where it kind of fattens up the sound a little bit. So it doesn't necessarily sound like it's just you playing along. <laughs> Uh, you can get, if you have a 12 string guitar too, you can get some natural chorus if you, like most of us, have ever tried a 12 string. It's never quite in tune with itself, so you get some natural chorusing uh, that way too. So another really similar effect is like a flanger or a phaser. So if I go down here, um, they're going to be really, really similar especially with each other. So the difference on a phaser and a flanger um, is essentially uh, a, a phaser is frequency and pitch based. Uh, so it splits your input into two paths um, and uh, one plays a, a slightly, it's kind of like chorus where it'll play slightly detuned um, uh, you essentially playing back. The flanger is more time based. It splits your input uh, into two will slightly delay the second and then put it back together with itself. So while the definition kind of seems like they would be different, you kind of get roughly a similar effect. Um, 
And that's where like eruption from Eddie Van Halen comes in. He's using a drive and a phaser or a flanger, uh, and then Paranoid Android by Radiohead, and a lot of Brian May stuff with Queen uses uh, a l- quite a lot of phaser and flangers, um, which he uses it pretty light in the mix. It's not uh, as on the forefront as a lot of other ones, but it's definitely there, and it kind of adds to, to fatten up his sound a little bit because technically it is two, good, two of your signals uh, playing together. So I'm going to use this uh, Boss MD200 and swap to our phaser and flanger and play a little bit on that. Ah, yes, thank you. kind of hear it kind of swooping a little bit as the pitch goes. It's a bit more mid mid pushy. Even though it's not necessarily played with a phaser, but... But that's with when you want to... Um, you can combine, obviously, you can combine any effect, but uh, a lot of, like, the... Not necessarily hair metal stuff in the 80s, but a lot of that stuff they were using quite a lot of chorus and then you throw a drive on there and it kind of takes on a uh, like a almost robotic kind of sound which was pretty popular back then um moving on to my two reverbs here so i've got the afterneath and the ghost echo by earthquaker um uh, on here the ghost echo uh there was a pedal from the 60s and 70s called the echoplex which a lot of people really really liked and the echoplex uh was a tape delay but a some people really liked the preamp section of it, um, and uh, y- there are plenty and plenty of pedals um, that replicate the preamp section. This one kind of replicates a little bit of that, the delay slash echo sound on it. So I'm going to turn the reverb off the amp so you can hear what the pedal does. So I will do that. Again, clean. <laughs> got a longer tail for doing that kind of song but you can kind of hear how how it swirls in the background so it's a bit more uh, I guess otherworldly, which um, you can obviously set it so it's a lot lighter in the mix. But you'll find a lot of players really like that, especially if there's other instruments like a keyboard or another guitar player that's already playing something. You can kind of have this more in the background and do uh, like longer passes of chords. <laughs> Thank you. 
just overall really nice sounding reverb pedal. Um, what you'll find with a lot of reverb is you'll find more of like a standard or straight reverb, and you'll find more of an ambient reverb. So Ghost Echo kind of teeters that range between a little bit ambient and a little bit more standard like you would find on a spring or plate reverb amplifier like a Fender. Um, the Afterneath is definitely a more uh, ethereal or um, a more extreme reverb on that. So... <laughs> So you hear how long it can hold on to that reverb tail. And you'll often find something called shimmer on some of these reverb pedals where we'll add in a little bit of brightness and even sometimes even add in a little bit of um, like a higher octave of what you just played or sometimes even a lower octave. Um, I think they do reflection on this one, which I think is... Actually, while that's going, I'm going to see if I can demonstrate doing like something like a volume swell like I was talking about earlier um, and using something like the afterneath is a really cool effect. So I'm going to swap. Just because I can hit my, I can actually use the volume that's closer to me. gives it almost like a more of an organ feel in a in a sense like an old uh, pipe organ um, and you will see lots of guitar players do that with some of their reverbs and and delays and stuff like that to make it sound almost as far away from a guitar uh, as possible sometimes because sometimes it's just um, it's just serving what the song needs so if a song needs something that's not necessarily a guitar but you are a guitar player you have options to make your guitar sound completely different um, and there are pedals. Uh, I do have a compressor on here. Compression is one of those really hard to describe uh, effects because not everyone can hear the difference on a compressor. It is one of those things that's more tailored to like a studio use. Uh, I do like the MXR one because there actually is a meter that tells you how much that uh, signal is getting squished. So essentially all a compressor is doing is taking the the uh, hottest signal that you're doing and taking the uh, lightest signal you're doing and squishing them a little bit. So they're more in line with each other. Um, a lot of funk guitar players really like compressors because it'll squish out the sound a little bit and make it a bit more focused, which is primarily what um, guitar players will use compressors for. Um, Hopefully I can demonstrate it a little bit and kind of um, show a little bit what it can do. Actually, before I do that. So that's what it sounds like right now. So you can see that green bar on that pedal is showing how much it's squishing that sound. So the harder I hit it, it's not necessarily getting, the guitar itself is not really getting that much louder. It's keeping the volume level at a pretty much a, a uh, specific level. It's pretty much capping it. So it can't get any louder than that, even though if I took that off, I'm getting that volume increase on there. Um, so for some guitar players, they really like that. So um, they, they're not overstepping. They're not uh, necessarily overplaying. It's all in um, 
uh, one specific um, volume spectrum. Um, and obviously you can configure it so it lets some of that volume back out. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff you can do with compressors. They're just generally the harder ones to demonstrate because not every, I have it set pretty harsh uh, so it caps my volume on there because uh, a lot of compressors are a little hard to demonstrate, but kind of a, a, a neat idea there. So um, that's kind of a little bit of all the pedals that are out there. Does anyone else have any more questions or anything like that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to scoot this back. Sorry, say that one more time. I apologize. <laughs> uh, d uh, dialing the dials on the amp. Having, having it set in such a way that you, that you enjoy whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you override it. Yeah, I would probably say that's probably pretty close. Um, it's all so subjective, so one answer is never, like, a correct answer. Um, there's never necessarily a wrong answer by by any means um i generally like my amps fairly flat um i let the pedals do a lot of the work um like on this princeton uh i have my bass at about two my treble is actually a bit higher um it it depends on your instruments too some guitars feel much brighter and so um, I usually try and set it fairly neutral. This one's not necessarily as neutral. Um, if I swap. Add a bit more reverb. So uh, I'm going to boost the bass a little bit to make it a bit more even. So I just gave it a bit more body. A lot of it is just what your ear prefers. But yeah, like I was saying, I, I like setting it fairly even. Um, just seeing how it sounds. If it sounds a bit uh, lopsided one way or the other. Fender amps are, are easier, I think, to get a, a, a neutral sound out of because they are fairly neutral. That's kind of what they're known for. Um, what amp are you running? Okay. Yeah, so stuff like a Vox is a bit more brighter. The fender should be a bit more neutral. Um, it yeah, it just comes down to what you like. So if you take your, if you think your Vox is a little bit too bright, you could EQ some of that brightness out. But that's also part of the tonal characteristic of a lot of Voxes. Um, so um, and maybe some people don't like the neutralness of the fender it just kind of comes down to personal preference does that kind of answer your question <laughs> yeah they'll they'll influence the amplifier so um, if i cranked one of the treble it doesn't necessarily cancel out the treble that's on the amp but it'll just add to it uh and then that's why you get into didn't necessarily talk too much about it but eq pedals um have a tendency to um, some amplifiers are really bass heavy. Um, some older fenders are definitely notorious for that. So some people will buy an EQ pedal and EQ out some of that bass. And that might be like the first pedal in the chain because it's getting influenced first. Um, does that help a little bit more? Okay. Any other questions? Anything like that? Yes. All three. <laughs> um, like I mentioned a little bit, I've got that little acoustic board. I've seen guys use chorus on there. Um, I've seen guys use distortion for acoustic. Uh, if you've ever listened to, um, there's a 90s band called Cake, um, that the singer has a nylon string that he goes in through like a small distortion pedal. And that's, it sounds kind of odd, but that's also part of the characteristic of that band. So you can, and Fender even makes like an acoustic overdrive that's specifically for acoustics. Um, bassists really like compression pedals. Um, 
like the Fender Downtown Express has compression, distortion, and uh, like an EQ on it, which is really cool because it just helps dial in your sound a little bit more. Um, you can use distortion for basses. I think the Rumbles also have like an onboard uh, overdrive. Um, you can, uh, a lot of basses, funk basses, like uh, the envelope filters. They really like them. Um, uh, there's a bass player called Thundercat. He really likes them. Um, just as like a, uh, Bootsy Collins also liked a lot of his envelope filters. Um, yeah, there is no right or wrong answer. It's just, it's all personal preference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. That's a good question. Um, I, I'm not in, in, an end-all be-all bass player. <laughs> um, I do know, um, like, uh, Paul is, um, his, one of his main instruments is bass. Uh, he really likes the Downtown Express, which is that three, um, it also, it, it replaced his bass amp entirely because it has, it acts as a DI. Yeah, it's a Fender pedal. Um, it is a compressor. Um, so like we were talking about the compressor, it'll, it'll, um, squash some of your your high volume and some of your low volume, make it a bit more even. Uh, it's got an overdrive. I would say overdrive isn't super duper common for bass players, but it is there. Uh, and you get your EQ, and then you can send that out to the board. Um, so you don't have to have an amplifier. Um, some people do like having something still next to them, and so you can hear it a little bit better without having a monitor or something like that. Um, I kind of like having, um, if I was to do more bass stuff, I think I would get some sort of octave pedal uh, because my thought was I'm not particularly fond of five string basses, but there will be music that's written that will have the low B that's on a five string or a low D. Um, so my thought is having some sort of octave pedal where you would just fret your normal B on like the A string and then click it to have it do down an octave might be kind of helpful. I've been thinking of that. Yeah, I think I haven't tried it in practice, but in theory, it sounds like something that would be really helpful. Um, or yeah, you can also do some sort of like chorus pedal too. Some bass players use chorus. Um, not really delay for basses. It does exist, but um, they're a bit more focused. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. At that point, the compressor, the boss has a compressor and sustainer pedal. That might be uh, a bit of a help doing that. Um, cause you get, you can't, you can toggle them essentially, but on the, um, sustain side of it, uh, you've got a sustain switch so you can control how long that sustain is kind of like, like we were talking about with the Hazumi toss, um, but it's clean instead of fuzz. I think that's the CS3. I'm with you. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's been a while since we've had one in, but I think we still have one on order. But yeah, that might be a... Uh-huh. Okay. Yes. All right. <laughs> also, uh, one thing that we did want to mention, too. Uh, we're going to open it up here in a little bit to uh, like a petting zoo, essentially. We've got pedals in the front. We can absolutely swap them on anything here. If you want to try anything, absolutely go for it. Um, if you find something you do like, uh, since it is International Guitar Month, we have discounts uh, on stuff all across the board. Um, for today, on any effect pedal, we're going to do an extra 5% off for you guys for, for coming to the class and as a thank you. Um, and then I'm trying to think. Is there anything else? 
Any other questions? Camden has a question. I have a very stupid request <laughs> on the fact that we very rarely have this many pedals hooked up into a singular amp. Uh huh. So you want to hit up with all of them? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. And I, and I will start with the fader backed off all the way. <laughs> I uh, might be a little scared of doing that, but we're going to try it. Uh, loop on. Uh, let we get to play the game of how noisy this becomes. Oh. All right, this is going to be fun. I'll take Tornado for 200 points, Alex. Uh, interesting. All right. <laughs> I don't know if I'm scared enough to actually attempt something more. All right. So many pedals. Yeah, and then uh, next week as well, um, Andrew is going to be teaching um, kind of like how like basics of setting up a board um, as you can um, Diodario came out with a really cool pedal board uh, very recently um, we have been selling out of them very frequently um, it's called this uh, the expand pedal board so on here normally it ends like where the Hizumi toss uh, ends but you can actually there's two uh, latches you can actually expand it uh, pretty much the length of itself again. Uh, they make us a, uh, a one tier, excuse me, a one tier version of it, and then this is the two tier. Um, it is already pre-Velcroed, which is awesome, so you don't have to do it yourself, because a lot of pedal boards, like uh, if you ever come across like a pedal train, you have to put the Velcro on yourself. That's time consuming. It's Velcroed on the top and the bottom. So why you might want it on the bottom is we have the Fender um, engine room underneath, which is our power supply. So that's underneath and it's Velcroed to the bottom, which is super awesome. Um, and we'll get into more of that stuff uh, next week. Um, but that's a really cool system. We'll be talking about how to wire them up and order. Um, again, there's no rules, but there's generally, uh, both of these follow kind of a, a similar um, a uh, similar idea of uh, routing and stuff like that. Um, we'll go into what cables you might want to use and why and all sorts of stuff like that. But that'll be next week. Um, I think that's about it. So does anyone have any final questions before we open it up? All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And uh, we'll open it up. Uh, so if you want to try stuff, you can absolutely do so. And uh, yeah. <laughs>